Welcome to the Think Podcast with Joel Sedicase. I'm Joel Sedicase, and this is the show that tackles impossible questions from a biblical perspective to help you explain, share, and defend your faith, to defend the Christian worldview. Now, today I want to talk about evangelism, and specifically I want to address the question of the Great Commission, and does the Great Commission specifically require evangelism? There are going to be all kinds of questions bound up with that, and um, that's going to be the big idea that I want us to tackle today. Now, I should let you know that what I'm about to say is actually a sermon. It's a sermon that I've preached before and a sermon that I will preach again. And as I record this, I'm actually preparing this particular sermon for a church, a local church here in Chicago on the northwest side. Um, And so what I want to do is I want to sort of practice the sermon for you before I bring it to the congregation. And uh, as much as I value you, as much as there will be more people that listen to this podcast than listen to the sermon being preached on, uh, on Sunday, the highest priority that I have is to serve the local church. And so that's why I'm practicing in front of more people and uh, why I would view the Sunday sermon as being a higher priority because it's the church, it's the local church, and the local church is the top priority that I have. So really quick, if you haven't done so yet, please leave this podcast, the Think Podcast, a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. What that does is that really helps get the word out about the Think Podcast and encourages others to listen along. If you like the kind of content that we're creating, uh, please do that. That really does help other people find the podcast. So I want to tell you about a great leader. Now, stories of great leaders inspire me. And a truly great leader is someone who can inspire normal people to do extraordinary things. So I recently watched The Darkest Hour about Winston Churchill. Now, there was a leader. He was flawed, yes. Fallible, yes. You can point to a lot of things that he did wrong. But he was a solid leader during a dangerous time, during World War II. Now, during those years when World War II was raging on, England needed to increase coal production for the war effort. Energy generating coal was absolutely vital to the Allied cause. And so Churchill knew this, knew he needed to increase coal production, and knew that it was up to him to inspire the coal producers, the coal men down in the mines. And yet those who labored in the industry were not soldiers, and so it would have been difficult to rally them using typical language. You know, hey, you guys are on the front lines. They weren't on the front line, front lines. They weren't anywhere near the front lines. They were not generals, but they were toiling behind the scenes. And oftentimes, it undoubtedly felt as though they were far separated from the battles and the victories and the defeats that were raging on around the world. So Churchill, who was the British prime minister, knew that he needed to motivate the coal miners. So what he did was he gathered together the leaders, the labor leaders, and in his characteristic way, he painted a picture for them of a parade, a parade marching through the city that would be celebrating the end of the war and the victory of the UK and the allied forces. Now, first... Churchill said, would be the sailors who kept the sea lanes open. Then the soldiers from Dunkirk, pilots who fought the German Luftwaffe, the Air Force. Last would come the sweat-stained, soot-soaked men in miners' caps. Someone will cry, and where were you? And 10,000 voices would answer, We were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. Today, the church is in a war. The church is in a war no less than Britain was in a war in World War II. And it isn't celebrity evangelists or famous authors or YouTube pastors who are going to win this war. 
No, it's the humble, everyday Christians laboring in the power of the Holy Spirit behind the scenes in order to bring the gospel to their neighbors who will carry out the mission of the church and win the war. These are the ones with their faces to the coal. These are the ones who carry out the mission of the church and who ultimately will win the victory. Now, when I say bring the gospel, I'm talking about evangelism. Evangelism is perhaps one of the most misunderstood disciplines in the church today. You know, what activities count as evangelism? Does living a godly lifestyle count as evangelism? Many say that it is. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Who should be doing the work of evangelism? Is it the pastor? Is it every Christian in the church? Who should be doing that work? We'll talk about that. What is our motivation for evangelism? Should we be motivated by guilt? We'll talk about that as well. What we will see is that we are desperate for clarity around the issue of evangelism. And my hope is that today we will get that clarity. And we're going to get that clarity from Jesus himself. We'll see that our situation is in fact urgent and that we have work to do. Well, let's talk about urgency. How urgent is our situation? Well, if we look at the world as a whole, what we'll see is that the church is growing. The church is growing in Asia and the Middle East. And by church, I mean the universal church. Every Christian who has repented, trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. And the church is growing right now the fastest in Iran. Isn't that interesting? The church is growing the fastest in Iran. But here in the U.S., Not so much. Here in the U.S., the situation is a little different. In the United States, it takes 20 Christ followers each year to make a single disciple. 20 to 1. That's the ratio of how many believers it takes to create a single new disciple. Now, at that rate, what that means is this. It will take 20 years for one Christ follower to make a single disciple. 20 years per disciple to make a new disciple. And the cultural climate in our country is getting even more challenging. A lot of that is bound up with the fact that very few Americans have a biblical worldview. And statistically speaking, the number of Americans who have a biblical worldview, and that means that they interact with the Bible frequently, the Bible is transforming their relationships and shaping their choices. In 2018, the number was one out of every 11 Americans have a biblical worldview. So about 11%, no, about 9%. In 2019, that number decreased to 5%. One out of every 20 Americans now have a biblical worldview. They're interacting with the Bible frequently, It's transforming their relationships and it's changing their choices. So the number of Americans with a biblical worldview is decreasing. That is a massive challenge that we face and Christians are not meeting that challenge. Another recent survey found that nearly two thirds of Christians had not shared how to become a Christian with anyone in the last six months. Of those who are sharing their faith, One third of those who say that they've been sharing their faith did not believe that they had a personal responsibility to do so. And two thirds said that the way that they share their faith was by how they live, not by what they say. My friends, if the only way that you're sharing your faith is how you live, you are not actually sharing the gospel. Now, it has been said that modern problems require modern solutions. But for this problem, We're going to tap into a resource that's been tried and true for nearly 2,000 years. It is the opposite of a modern solution. And I'm talking about the Great Commission. And this is something that is very much in the DNA of gospel-preaching, gospel-believing churches. If you go to a solid church, this is in the DNA of your church. It's in the DNA of the church that I'm going to be speaking at coming up on Sunday. 
Now, the mission statement at the church where I'm going to be speaking, and maybe yours is very similar, is this. At our church, our mission, our vision is to glorify God by being a gospel-centered church that makes disciple makers. Our vision then is to make disciples. Our mission then is to make disciples who make disciples. Now, this church also has values, and one of those values is to go outward. And it reads like this, as ambassadors for Christ charged with the ministry of reconciliation and as lights in a dark world, we go out to those outside the family of God in order to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ and follow him as disciples and have our God ordained good works shown to the world and be used to give God glory. Man, I love that. So carrying out the great commission or your church's piece of the Great Commission is already a priority for you. If your church has a mission statement that is anything like that, my own church's mission statement is to know God and make Him known. The vision statement of my church is we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives, renews the city, and impacts the world. So carrying out our piece of the Great Commission is already a priority for us. And today we're we're going to explore how to do that. And we're going to talk about the connection between the Great Commission and evangelism. So let's read together Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. And this is the passage that we call the Great Commission. There are other passages you could also rightly call Great Commissions or Commissions. But what I want to do is I want to read this passage and then I want to talk about its connection to evangelism. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, this text is called the Great Commission, and it's all about making disciples. But we're here talking about evangelism. And so the big question that we need to ask is, what is the connection between evangelism and disciple making? Another way of asking that question, which is the title of this podcast episode, is, does the Great Commission specifically require evangelism? Is it possible for your church to be a disciple-making church without being an evangelistic one. Well, what I want to show you is this, and this is the big idea today. Without evangelism, there is no Great Commission. Without evangelism, there is no Great Commission. All right, so what is evangelism? I really like Bill Bright's definition of evangelism. Bill Bright is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is my parent organization, the Think Institute's parent organization. Here's what it says. Here's what he says. Evangelism is taking the initiative to share the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Now, the intent here is to persuade. You could also say that it is proclaiming Christ's lordship and salvation and inviting others to receive him. So we're going to look at three reasons why we evangelize based on the Great Commission. So what we're going to see is that the the Great Commission specifically requires evangelism. And those three reasons are this. Because of Christ's clout, because of Christ's command, and because of Christ's company. Let's start by looking at Christ's clout. Don't you love that word, clout? When was the last time you heard that in a sermon? So we get this from verse 18, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, by clout... I'm talking about the Chicago definition of clout, all right? I'm speaking to you from the northwest side of Chicago. That's where I live. That is where the Think Institute is based out of. That's where the Think Institute study is. And I'm talking about the Chicago definition of clout. And that was popularized by columnist Mike Royko in the 1960s. And by clout, we mean this. Influence connections, the wherewithal to get things done. In short, clout is the Chicago word for authority. And what we see in this text is that authority has been given. Jesus says, all authority has been given. Well, authority over what? Authority over 
heaven and earth. How much authority? All of it. Who gave this authority? God. To whom did God give this authority? All authority over heaven and earth. He gave it to Jesus. Now, why did God give Jesus this authority? Because Jesus earned it. Jesus obediently humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. And the goal of his obedience, the goal of his humbling himself to the point of death on the cross was that every knee would bow to Jesus. That's what we find in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So all authority has been given to Jesus, and one day every knee will bow to Jesus. Now, I've got four kids, and my kids love the show The Lion Guard. Do you know what The Lion Guard is? The Lion Guard is the continuing adventures of the cast and crew of The Lion King. Now, in the movie The Lion King, which is what The Lion Guard is based off of, Mufasa, the king lion, brings his young son Simba to the top of Pride Rock. And he shows him the Pride Lands. And he looks, and he says, Look, Simba, everything the light touches is our kingdom. So it's a little bit like that. You know, it's a little bit like that. It's more expansive than that. But when we say Jesus has all authority, what we're saying is he is king over every area in the cosmos, every area in the universe. This means that every nation and every people group belong to Jesus already, right now. They belong to Jesus. Jesus is reigning right now as king. What does that mean for us? It means that what he tells us to do is not optional. When when Jesus gives the scope of the Great Commission and he says that it's for all nations, he's sending us out to the nations that he has authority over. So what does this mean for us? It means that we evangelize because of Christ's clout. Because Jesus has authority everywhere, our mission field is everywhere. See, the gospel must go out. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says that we must go to, he he sent his disciples to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But as as a church in Chicago or a church in your city, you would be considered the ends of the earth. Why? Because we live in the United States. We live in in North America, which was considered the ends of the earth. Matter of fact, Jesus' disciples didn't know about North America. And so your piece of the Great Commission is going to be unique. It's it's going, and I, I've got listeners from actually all over the world to the Think Podcast. So wherever you are, whether you're in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, or the ends of the earth, your piece of the Great Commission is going to be unique, but it's your piece. You have that piece. And because Jesus is the authority over you in your locale, this must matter to you. You've been called by someone who has all authority in order to make disciples. And making disciples is going to require evangelism, which is what we're going to see. Jesus is the authority over all of the world, but that also means that Jesus is the authority over you and your life and every arena of your life. Because Jesus has all authority, that means he is the authority over your church life, your work life, your home life, your family life, your alone time, your social sphere, your friends, it's all his. And so if you're going to see your church and your life turn the corner on evangelism, turn the corner on discipleship, it begins with seeing this. Fulfilling your church's piece of the Great Commission begins with recognizing that disciple making means bringing the good news to every area of your city and every area of life. And that is going to involve everyone because it's all Christ's. Now, let's talk about the second reason why we evangelize. Because evangelism is the announcing of Christ's rule and Christ's authority. Remember what we said is evangelism is is announcing the authority of Christ and his salvation. Now let's talk about the second reason why we evangelize. We evangelize because of Christ's command. We evangelize because of his clout. We evangelize because of his command. Now there is a twofold command in verse 19. What it says is, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Now, this twofold command is go and make disciples. Now, I used to think this was a single command. I thought it was make disciples and that go was a modifier, meaning as you go, while you go, having gone, etc. Now, th- I thought this because the word is technically going in the original Greek. It's, it's a participle. It's an ing word, ing. It's going. However, upon further study, what I realized, what I learned is that the word, com- it, the word go is a command unto itself. It is associated with making disciples. It's tied to making disciples, but it is a command in and of itself. Now, why is that? Because Jesus is telling his disciples to disciple the nations. And where are the nations? Well, the nations are elsewhere. They weren't going to just naturally go to the nations. They had to be sent to the nations. And so going is a command. So now the question is, well, who should go? Well, who should go? The church that Jesus Jesus started through the first disciples should go. But we also know that it's not just the disciples. Because Jesus promises to be with them. We're going to see this in a minute. Jesus promises to be with them till the end of the age. Well, who are the disciples How long did the disciples live? Did the disciples live until the end of the age? No. The disciples lived during their lifetimes and then they died. Many of them were martyred for the faith. But Jesus' promise here is to the end of the age, he would be with them. So what we find out here is that Jesus is giving a promise through the disciples to the rest of the church. He's promising to be with the church till the end of the age. And so if he's promising to be with the church, he's also commanding the church to go and make disciples. You see, the command and the promise are so inextricably linked that if you want the promise, you have to get the command with it. And this is related to John chapter 17, when Jesus prays for those who would believe as a result of the disciples' message. When Jesus is speaking to the disciples, we can read that and we can say, this is not just for them, this is for us as well, because we have believed through the disciples. So the promise is for us and therefore the command is also for us. Now, why should we go to the nations? Because Jesus has clout. Jesus has authority over us, and he commands it. Because Jesus has authority too, he has authority over them. Jesus cares about the nations. Now, when should we go? Well, Jesus says in Acts 1.8 that we will be his witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon us. And the Holy Spirit comes upon a person when he repents and trusts in Jesus Christ. So we should go when we trust in Christ. We should go when we are sent by God. According to Romans 10, 14 and 15, here's what it says. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Commenting on this verse, John Calvin, one of the great reformers, said this. He intimates that it is a proof and a pledge of divine love whenever any nation is favored with the preaching of the gospel and that no one is a preacher of it, but he whom God has raised up in his special providence and that hence there is no doubt, but that he visits that nation to whom the gospel is proclaimed. In other words, if you're preaching, God has sent you. If you're going, God has sent you. The point is, if someone is preaching the gospel, they have been sent by God to do so. The point is rhetorical. How could this evangelist be preaching to those who are believing unless he had been sent? The answer, he couldn't. God must have sent him. So here's the point. The Holy Spirit calls us and sends us. If you've ever shared the gospel with anyone, you were tasked with that task by God, by the Holy Spirit. You were sent. And my prayer is that after today, the Lord will send you again and again and again. So then going is the first step in carrying out the Great Commission. And it's a crucial step in making disciples, which is the second part of the command. He says to go and he says, make disciples. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple in the original language is the word mathetes, which means someone who obeys, follows, and emulates Jesus. So how do we make a disciple? And this is really going to be the crucial connection between evangelism and discipleship. Okay? How do we make a disciple? This is how we're going to see that the Great Commission requires discipleship. And that without the Great Commission requires evangelism. And that without evangelism, there is no Great Commission. How do we make a disciple? 
we induct him into the people of God, into the church, both the universal church and the local church, by baptizing him into the, the triune name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we teach him to obey all that Jesus commanded. Well, what has Jesus commanded? While there is a litany of commands, there's probably about at least 100 commands in the New, in the New Testament. These would all fall under the law of Christ. But the very first command of Christ in the New Testament, in, the, in, in his ministry, I should say, is found in Mark 1.15. His first command is this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So his very first command is to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus is proclaiming his lordship, his authority, the good news that the kingdom of God is coming, that you can be saved, and that salvation comes through Jesus. And this, my friends, this is evangelism. This is the connection between evangelism and discipleship. So when you share the gospel, you are beginning to disciple that person. The rest of discipleship follows from that initial evangelism. So without evangelism, there is no discipleship. And there is therefore no great commission without evangelism. Without evangelism, there is no great commission. In other words, the great commission specifically requires evangelism. Now the greatest command that Jesus ever gave is, not that all the commands of Jesus aren't great, they're all, we have to, we have to obey all of them, obviously. But in John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says this, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Do you think of it this way? Uh, do, you, do you follow up when you share the gospel? One of the best things that we can do after we begin to evangelize is to invite our non-believing friend into Christian community. This is what Matthew did when Jesus called him. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. The command to go and make disciples is an urgent one. It's straight for Jesus. It's authoritative for the church. It's for you and me. And it involves evangelism and bringing non-believers into a context where they can see the love that Christians have for one another. That's part of discipleship. Now, the early church understood this command, and we see this in the lives of the apostles. Now, there is an early legend that the apostles cast lots and divided up the world. They divided up the known world at that time. And we see this because they went out into the world. They went out to disciple the world. Now, I'm going to have a very, very special guest coming up on the podcast, Lord willing. I'm going to have Sean McDowell on this podcast. If you don't know who he is, he's an apologist and a scholar and the son of Josh McDowell, who... Many people don't know this, but he's a crew missionary as well, like myself. Uh, Josh McDowell wrote the book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I've got it here on my desk. And um, I'm going to have James, uh, I'm going to have Sean McDowell on the podcast to talk about the fate of the early apostles. But uh, that's not yet. That's coming up. But I want to just talk about what the early history and, and tradition says about the apostles. So you've got James, son of Alphaeus. He was in Jerusalem and he was killed there. Matthias, he was a local missionary in Jerusalem. Just like Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Uh, James, son of Zebedee, was he went to Judea. He was killed in Judea. Andrew preached to modern-day Georgia and Bulgaria. He was martyred in Achaia. Bartholomew was a missionary to India. He was martyred in Armenia, modern-day southern Georgia. That's the country, not the state. John led the church in Ephesus. He was eventually exiled to Patmos. Matthew led a mission to Parthia, which is modern-day Iran. He was a missionary to Iran. Simon Peter traveled to Italy after preaching around the region of modern-day Turkey. Philip was a missionary to Phrygia, which is eastern Turkey. Simon the Zealot was the bishop of Jerusalem. Thaddeus, also known as Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, preached to Upper Mesopotamia and modern-day Iraq, northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, and southwestern Iran. He died in Lebanon. 
Thomas was a missionary to the people groups of modern day Iran and Afghanistan, and he was killed in India. In fact, today there are there are um, St. Thomas Christians who trace their lineage back to the evangelism of Thomas. And the Apostle Paul made it as far as modern day Croatia and Italy and possibly even Spain. So you see, these early Christians spread out over the world, sowing the seed of the gospel, evangelizing and reaping harvest after harvest. They planted churches, they evangelized their communities because they understood that the Great Commission does require evangelism. In order to disciple the nations, you have to evangelize the nations. And their churches grew, and they sent out emissaries to plant new churches. New peoples were evangelized through these emissaries, and the cycle continued. And if you trace out this process in history, you will eventually get to Europe, and then from Europe, through by way of the Puritans and others, to North America, and then by, by way of the pioneers, uh, west westward, eventually here to the great city of Chicago. And so I'm here in Chicago as a result of the early evangelism and disciple-making of those early Christians and evangelists. Now, that's um, that's all well and good, you might say. But, you know, the Great Commission just really applied to the disciples. It applied to the apostles. This doesn't apply to our day. It was just given to them. Well, I've already hit on that when I said that the promise was not just for them. But look at 1 Peter 2.9. Now, this is in the context of Peter addressing the whole church. Here's what he says. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, everyone who has been saved this way has a job to do. Everyone who's been saved by Jesus has the job of proclaiming Christ's excellencies. See, this is the same as declaring his lordship and salvation. Those are his excellencies. Now that is evangelism. That's sharing the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's the purpose of every Christian. In John 20, 21, which is John's version of the Great Commission, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's just three chapters after Jesus prayed for the disciples and those who would believe through their testimony. He sent them, and he's also sending us. We need to see that Jesus has commanded the church to go and make disciples. Now, will everyone go overseas? No. Will everyone physically be baptizing? No. Will everyone teach a discipleship class or a membership class? No. But the Great Commission is for the church. And every one of you is a part of the church. And therefore, every one of you has some role to play. And every one of you is going to come into contact with non-believers who need to hear the gospel and they need evangelism. And part of your role is evangelism, is sharing the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. See, we evangelize because Jesus, who has all clout in heaven and on earth, has commanded it. And in this way, you and I fulfill our piece of the Great Commission. Without evangelism, there is no Great Commission. Now, third point, we evangelize. The third reason why we evangelize is because of Christ's company. Or we might say because of Christ's companionship. We evangelize because Jesus is with us. And we get this beautiful promise in verse 20. We see that Jesus loves you and has not left you alone in this process. Jesus is proving himself to truly be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus says in that last verse of the Great Commission, he says, behold. In the King James, he says, lo, which means look. In the CSB, he says, remember. So as you go, as you make disciples, we are to remember what Jesus says next. So what is the promise that we should remember as we go? If you look at verse 20, it says we should remember Jesus. We should look at, we should behold Jesus. Where is Jesus? We're going to look for Jesus. We're going to, we're going to behold Jesus. Where is he? Where can we see him? Well, he is with us. He is within us by his spirit, 
by the Holy Spirit. He's also moving through his kingdom. He's moving through all nations. He's awakening his chosen people, his elect, to the truth of the gospel. Those whom God chose in him before the foundation of the world, that they should be holy and blameless before him. Now, there was a great missionary named Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the director of the China Inland Mission. He interviewed missionary candidates all the time because he had developed such a reputation that there were many Christians who wanted to come and join him on his mission. And Hudson Taylor would ask these missionary candidates, he would ask them, why do you want to be a missionary? And they would answer, because Christ has commanded us, or because millions are perishing without Christ. Well, Hudson Taylor told them. Now, this gets to the question of motivation, which I hinted at earlier, which I said we were going to discuss. Hudson Taylor told them, all these motives, however good, will fail you in times of testings, trials, tribulations, and possible death. There is but one motive that will sustain you in trial and testing, namely, the love of Christ. See, the love of Christ that goes with you will sustain you. So we evangelize, we bring the gospel to our neighbors and invite them to repent and trust in Jesus because we have experienced Christ's love and we continue to do so. And we believe that the love of Christ and the presence of Christ, the companionship, the company of Christ, will go with us. And the Apostle Paul goes so far as to say that the love of Christ controls us. He says this in 2 Corinthians 5.14. And the love of Christ, the love of Christ compels us to urge others to be reconciled to God. See, Jesus doesn't promise to make it easy for us, but he promises to be with us. And if it's hard, it's hard. Jesus knows the thing or two about hardship, though, doesn't he? And he will get us through. He will be with us. So let's talk about some of the reasons now why we don't evangelize. Why wouldn't we evangelize? Given Christ's clout, given Christ's uh, command, given his company, why wouldn't we evangelize? Now, at this point, you might want to take a moment and really ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is holding you back. Listen for the ones, as I list these, listen for the ones that apply to you. Well, there are really three categories of objections. Priorities, lack of skill or know-how, and fear. Priorities manifest in these ways. Um, I don't want to offend this person. Um, I don't have the opportunity. I don't have any desire to share. Listen, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. If your priorities are out of whack, My friends, we need to humbly pray about that and pray that God would change our priorities. Change your priorities and get them in line with the Lord. Matthew 6.23 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will add all these other things that you need. Second category then is lack of skill or know-how. You know, I don't know what to say. I I don't have enough experience. I, I... I don't know how to explain the gospel or my story, my own testimony. I don't know how to answer their tough questions. And, you know, I'm not an evangelist. That's really the pastor's job. Well, the answer to that is, is, is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So trust the Holy Spirit. Out of worship of Christ, learn and practice. Trust the Holy Spirit. Leave the results up to God, but, but make a commitment to learn how to share the gospel and share it well. By the way, the Think Institute, we offer all kinds of resources on how to do that. You could scroll through the archives of this very podcast and and find episodes that are relevant to you. And then the third category is fear. You know, Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare. Fear manifests itself, itself like this. I'll get in trouble if I talk about Jesus at work. I don't want to risk ruining this relationship. Talking about my faith makes me too uncomfortable. Well, here's the answer to fear. The Bible says that perfect love drives out fear. Do you know that Jesus is with you? Jesus loves you? And Jesus wants you to take that risk. Does that mean you get a bullhorn and bring it to your workplace? No, probably not. But there are ways that you can be as crafty as serpents and as innocent as doves in order to share the gospel with your coworkers, even 
building on the foundation that you may leave during the workplace. See, we need to obey God rather than man. Acts 419 says this. So to conclude then, the church has a vision for fulfilling Christ's mission. Your church exists as a body to spread the fame of Jesus' name through discipleship. That is a wonderful, Christ-honoring mission, and God will absolutely honor it. Now, in Cojourners, the evangelism class that I teach, I talk about several ways to grow in your skill at sharing the gospel. And there are three practical commitments that you can make in order to do this. One, commit to sharing, commit to making disciples. We've seen that disciple making requires evangelism. Believe that the, pro- the process begins when you start sharing your faith and see how far the Lord will let you take it. But commit to making disciples. Number two, commit to asking better questions. Explore the other person's soul, their spiritual landscape, and look for entry points for the gospel. Ask the question, may I share with you what's made a huge difference in my own life? And three, commit Romans 6.23 to memory. I can't recommend this highly enough. Memorize Romans 6.23 as a one-verse presentation of the gospel that comes in three Ps, problem, provision, and person. Problem, the wages of sin is death. Provision, the free gift of God is eternal life. And person, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus is the one that makes it happen, that, makes, that brings someone from the side of death to the side of life. And then finally, practice and pray for God to give you opportunities. You know, praying for opportunities to share the gospel is a request that God always answers for me. If I'm on an airplane, if I'm, at, if I'm uh, out in the workplace, wherever, if I'm around my city, God gives me opportunities, but we need to pray for them. You know what, if you're a dad, if you're a mom, you can start with your kids. Share the gospel with your kids. Hey, kids, have I ever told you the gospel, the good news about Jesus? Now, I know if you go to a good church, it is a deep desire of your elders at your church. But it's also the desire of your true senior pastor, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep, which is what pastor means, that you fulfill your piece of the Great Commission by making disciples in your city, in your neighborhood. For me, that's the north side of Chicago. Now the need is urgent. And now is the time for us to obey the Great Commission. And that's going to mean getting serious in your own life about sharing your faith, about evangelism. Because without evangelism, there is no Great Commission. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. If you want to connect with the Think Institute, please do so by going to thethink.institute. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Think Institute, on Twitter at ThinkInst. Drop me an email at thethink.institute at gmail.com if you have any questions, complaints, concerns, or conundrums. And you know what? This is not goodbye. This has just been a little pit stop along the way of your spiritual journey. And I hope that over the next week you have the opportunity to put what you just heard into practice. And until next time, I hope it makes you think.